Tyler Kolick. Uh, 34th pick in the draft. The Knicks traded a few uh, second-round picks to the Portland Trail Blazers to acquire Kolick and then paid him. Uh, I think that it's the highest guaranteed money for a second-round pick. What were your impressions of, of Kolick through his, his tenure at Marquette and, and the few uh, summer league games with the Knicks? Well, I love that pick, and it made all the sense in the world. You know, during the mock draft portion of it, you know, being a projected with him, he fits Tom Thibodeau. I mean, there's no doubt about that. I, I've been close to that program especially more the last couple of years because we've had different reunions back there for our final four team and being back to speak to their team and see practice. So you, so you grow to watch him more and you grow to love him. And I just think what he does is, is, is it benefits everybody. And he's improved numerous ways since he was with Shaka Smart at Marquette. He's a much better shooter. Um, he goes to his right much better. He plays with his eyes up all the time. He's a precision passer. He's going to take some chances, but more often than not, they're going to be precision. He's going to deliver the ball on time on target. He he was there were two things that I thought he was as good at as anybody in the draft was making layups and and throwing pocket passes. And now I think as you as you watch all his summer league clips, the adjustment he's going to have to make is getting it off his hip just a little bit quicker. Um, I mean, there's some guys that are just absolutely you know phenomenal at how quick they get the ball up on that reach layup. Josh Giddy comes to mind on that. Tyrese Maxey comes to mind on that. And Tyler Kolick may not have to have that quickness, but he's got to have that kind of acceleration with the ball. And I think you'll get that. I think he even saw it in the summer leagues. He started adjusting to different lengths and things like that. But he can deliver the ball. Uh, he can defend. Um, he wins. He's tough. He's competitive. Uh, I know from being around there and talking to those coaches, he was in that gym all the time. And, and what I like about him is that as good as he got, you know, the NIL money came, the, the, the stature came, the Big East Player of the Year came, he never lost the humility and the hunger to want to improve. Mm. And sometimes when you're young in college, that's, that's not as easy as it seems because it's all coming at you and all of a sudden you're kind of like, you, you go to George Mason, you don't expect in a couple of years you're going to end up being Big East Player of the Year. That's right, just not, right. how it, it's not how it works. But he handled all that, and he stayed incredibly hungry, led a really good team. And I think you could tell what it was like when they didn't have him, you know, when he got mm. hurt late in the year. But he just makes a difference. And I think he's going to be – I thought I thought this a year ago for sure, going back to a year and a half, he's going to play 10, 12 years easy in the NBA. How do you see – because as you said – defense could be the thing that will allow him to see a few minutes in Tibbs' rotation this year. Sure. How do you envision Tibbs working with him defensively to to improve? Well, he'll get him even better with his hands. He'll get him better at anticipating the screen. And, and because of all the different coverages, he'll get him better even on the weak side. And I think what he'll do is he'll, is he'll rely on him to talk on that weak side. And I think with the new NBA now, you know, when you look at the, the the way the taxes are and first apron, second apron and things of that nature, those young guys right now, they have to play. Like yeah, you have yeah. to have some young guys that have to come in and play. You could say that, say that with Pacom Dadier. Those guys at some point, because of the way the season is and because of what they cost versus what a eight to 10 year veteran costs on your team right now with the tax situation, they're going to get them ready. And that's a situation where Tom is in an upper echelon of NBA coaches in the sense that if you're not committed to the teaching of your young players and putting them in tough situations, and maybe not necessarily in the games early on, but putting them in hold, hold them accountable situations in practice, you're missing the boat. And I think the coaches that, that, that have the highest level of care about player development, you know, and certainly in the East, Tom is at the top of the list. Uh, Eric Spolstra is at the top of that list. I think Quinn Snyder uh, is one of those guys. There's others, but we're like, they are. Joe Mazzula has a chance at this because he was a development guy. So, mm -hmm. like, he understands the level of development. And not every program develops their players. But if it's got to come if either, either from the general manager, president, or the head coach on the demands and trickle down to everybody else. And Tom is one of those guys that's never been afraid to get out there and work with those guys on his own. And I think that's that's part of what makes him who he is. And so he knows what development is supposed to look like. He's going to demand it. And I think he's going to have younger guys more ready to play a lot of times than some of these other guys in the NBA will.